Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gaetan Verna, and I'm the director of the power plant. Uh, welcome to this event. Thank you for joining us for this evening for another installment in the gallery's ongoing series titled In Conversation. The series, which presents contemporary artists and curators who discuss aspects of their practice. Tonight's program in the series marks a very special co-presentation between the power plant and authors at Harborfront Center. We are really pleased to collaborate with authors as part of their 39th season. And I would like to thank Jeffrey Taylor, Christine Sarstorsis, Julia Yu, and the rest of authors team for working with us to present tonight's conversation. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with one of the summer's exhibition at the power plant titled Postscript Writing After Conceptual Art, featuring more than 50 artists and writers from Canada and international artists that are presented in this exhibition. So I encourage you to come back and see the exhibition at the power plant if you haven't already. The exhibition is free thanks to our annual support from BMO Financial Group. Postscripts comes to the power plant from the Museum of Contemporary Art, Denver, and I would like to thank the supporters who have helped us to bring this exhibition in Toronto, the gallery's very own power players, which are BMO Financial Group, Manulife Financial, Rogers, and TD Bank. All of our gallery's public programs are generously supported by primary education sponsor CIBC and all our programs are free to members of the power plant. So I encourage you to become a member of the power plant if you aren't already. So now please welcome Curator of Education and Public Programs at the power plant, Kristen Bowen, who will introduce the featured speakers this evening. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce two of the founders of the conceptual writing movement, Kenneth Goldsmith and Christian Book. They have been conversing together for many years and this discourse has been one of the generative engines of this movement. So it is a great privilege to have them here continuing this dialogue with us this evening. I have also had the privilege of working with both Kenneth and Christian over this past week. Kenneth taught an intensive four-day uncreative writing workshop, and Christian read at the opening of the exhibition Postscript and led a training session with our gallery attendants. I'm extremely grateful to both of them for their generosity. And it is this generosity combined with rigor that is distinctive about both of our guests, a rigorous generosity of intellect and of self that is extremely rare and have made their engagements here so meaningful for our program participants. So thank you both very much. Both authors have prepared a reading, and then they will engage in conversation together. We will have time for questions at the end. So first, Kenneth Goldsmith is the author of 11 books of poetry and the founding editor of the online archive Ubu Web. He teaches writing at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is a senior editor of the online poetry archive Penn Sound. In 2011, he read at President Obama's A Celebration of American Poetry at the White House and held a workshop with the First Lady. He also co-edited Against Expressionism, an anthology of conceptual writing, and published a book of essays, Uncreative Writing, Managing Language in the Digital Age. Goldsmith was a participant in Documenta 13 in Germany in 2012 and was appointed, appointed the Museum of Modern Art's first poet laureate in 2013. Christian Book is the author of Unoya, a best-selling work of experimental literature that won the Griffin Poetry Prize in 2002. He is well known for his virtuoso recitals of sound poems and has perfor performed at more than 200 venues around the world in the last four years. He is currently finishing the Xenotext, a project that requires him to engineer the genome of an indestructible bacterium whose DNA might become not only a durable archive to store poems, but also an operant machine that writes poems in response. And he teaches at the Department of English in the University of Calgary. So please join me first in welcoming Kenneth Goldsmith to the stage. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christine. Uh, and it is such a, uh, an honor to be here. And thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, the show is great. Um, and I think we'll talk about its importance uh, as during the question, I'm sorry, during the uh, discussion period uh, over at the power plant. But it's, it's kind of a watershed for conceptual writing uh, on many levels. And so I'm very grateful to be involved uh, in this. So I'm going to read tonight uh, briefly from my new book called Seven American Deaths and Disasters. Wow, it's weird because uh, I'm hearing this music and I'm seeing this online video of the three Charlie's angels running out of a door, you know. Uh-oh, Jeff McKinney's running into the room. Well, much talk today about Farrah Fawcett, certainly, but now there is news that Michael Jackson has been rushed to a hospital. Um, I think it's in Los Angeles. I'm not sure. The CBS newsroom has just come on saying that there is a special report coming up for Michael Jackson's physical condition, which is apparently uh, dire at the moment. It's so interesting. Before we came on the air today, I, I, I hope this isn't the case, uh, but Jimmy and I were talking about how things happen in threes. We just lost Ed McMahon, today we lose Farrah Fawcett, and now we're hearing Jeff McKinney walking in telling us, I, I, I'm not saying he's ill. I, I'm not saying he's, he's, he's ill, I'm saying he's ill. I, I don't know how dire he is, but the indication is that he is quite ill. They're gonna run a special report. They don't do that lightly, the folks back in New York. So we're gonna do this in about 10 seconds here. We're gonna get the latest on Michael Jackson. Boy, there's a lot of curiosity here. All right, so let's take it away. It's 4.15. This is the CBS News special report. I'm Dan Revive. We are receiving word from Los Angeles that the pop superstar Michael Jackson has been rushed to a hospital. The Los Angeles Times website says it got some confirmation from the LA Fire Department that Michael Jackson was not breathing when paramedics arrived and took him to the hospital. Let's go to the CBS newsroom now in Los Angeles. Correspondent Steve Futterman, what are you learning? Dan, we're just hearing these reports, still nothing confirmed. Reportedly, Michael Jackson has been taken to the UCLA Medical Center, which is not far from his home, but nothing official yet from the UCLA Medical Center. According to the Los Angeles Times, Captain Steve Ruda, who's with the LA Fire Department, says that paramedics responded to a call at Jackson's home around 12.26 local time. That's just two hours ago. According to the Times, he was not breathing when they arrived. The paramedics, according to the newspaper, performed CPR and took him to the UCLA Medical Center. The website TMZ says that Jackson was in cardiac arrest and that the paramedics administered CPR in the ambulance. According to TMZ, Michael Jackson's mother is on the way or may be there already at the UCLA hospital to visit him. But again, we want to emphasize there has been no official confirmation. Two reports, one from the LA Times, one from the website TMZ, both of them saying that Michael Jackson has been taken to a hospital. Jackson, by the, by the way, is age 50. This comes on the same day that the actress and star Farrah Fawcett died of cancer in Los Angeles at age 62. CBS News Special Report, I'm Dan Revive. Okay, so as far as we know, Michael Jackson is still alive, but there are reports saying that he was in uh, cardiac arrest when uh, the EMTs got to him and were administering CPR as they rushed Michael Jackson to the hospital. Shocking to hear that Michael Jackson is 50 years old. I was just thinking that. You know, we were talking earlier about how, you know, it seems like yesterday we were watching Farrah Fawcett in her youth and beauty. And 62 years old to me is still young. You don't think of Farrah Fawcett being 62 years old. And you don't think of Michael Jackson as being 50. It's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's just strange. Well, there, there are some real parallels between these two people, Farrah Fawcett and Michael Jackson, in that they both had overwhelming, huge effects of popularity in their hey heyday. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
I mean, Michael Jackson did have the same sort of uh, different effect, but had the same sort of uh, all-encompassing effect on 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 uh, on on the world as uh, Farrah Fawcett did. You know. When he was in his height, 1983, 1984, his peak, it was like nothing you'd ever seen. I mean, it was, uh, wait, 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 but you could say the same for Farrah Fawcett. Yeah, you, you could. I, I think, you, I think you, you're right, you could. You could absolutely say the same for her. And then she went and married uh, Steve Majors. Uh, Steve Majors, uh, remember she became Farrah Fawcett? Six million dollar Lee Majors. Yeah, yeah, Lee Majors. Why did I think it was Steve Majors? Next thing you know, I'll be saying Paul Majors, but no, it was Lee Majors. Fair Fawcett herself as well, I mean, there is, you know, in her heyday, uh, for a brief period of time, excuse me? Well, for a brief period of time she had, at least domestically, she was about as famous as you can get within the confines of the United States of America. Absolutely, Charlie's Angels was the biggest hit on television. And that poster, that famous poster of her, the poster, yeah, that was a big seller. Her biggest seller, I mean, she did, she did a spread for Playboy in the 90s, and that was the biggest selling issue of the decade. I mean, she was a big star as well. Do you know what kind of problems uh, Michael Jackson had in regarding his health? Well, I, 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 don't, I didn't know that he had any. I mean, he has had occasional fainting attacks and things like that. We've never heard that. I mean, he's certainly never looked robust. Michael Jackson never looked robust, to say the least. Nope. But I think this is the first indication we, 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 we've ever had that Michael Jackson has had any sort of serious health issues, and this appears to be a serious health issue. Hey, two updates have just come to tell us here from TMZ in the last few minutes. A Jackson family member tells TMZ that Michael is in, quote, really bad shape and that the brothers are now headed to UCLA. Well, that sounds very unofficial, of course. Yes, and here's another update from TMZ saying that they've just got off the phone with Joe Jackson, that's the father, Michael's dad, who says he is, quote, not doing well. Okay. So? So Farrah Fawcett has died, the great superstar of the 70s, and now the great superstar of the 80s, equaling her stardom. There are reports that he has been in cardiac arrest this afternoon and has been rushed to the hospital in Los Angeles. So stay tuned, I guess. We'll continue to get news on that throughout the day. There are probably at least a thousand people outside the hospital right now where he is in Los Angeles. Evidently, they're gathering and they're in a perfect rectangle. I guess they're holding some sort of a uh, seance. Not a seance, a vigil. Well, a seance would make more sense for him. And he's got plenty of eccentricities, but the music. Well, he doesn't have anywhere close to the talent that Elvis had. We're not talking about talent, we're talking about influence. I'm just saying that Elvis's influence overshadows his by a hundred times. I, 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 I don't know about that, I do. Well, okay, I'm saying, say, between 1980 and 1990. I mean, doesn't he have like five of all the top, top ten all-time records sold? Jeff, Jeff, there are still people that want to sound like Elvis. There's nobody that wants to sound like Michael Jackson. Not the impersonators. I'm talking about real, man, real bands. I mean, you know, not the Elvis impersonators. Elvis will be impersonated for another hundred years. It's got nothing to do with impersonation. You've got real rock bands out there who still love Elvis and are trying to do the music like Elvis. Without Elvis is their rock and roll, you know? It, what is Michael Jackson responsible for? I mean, what did he come up with that was so special? He created a video channel, essentially. I mean, if not for Michael Jackson videos, MTV wouldn't be on and wouldn't be what it is today. Oh, so we can blame him for that. On the other hand, there's the Jackson 5. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome up on the stage the Jackson 4. Doesn't have the same ring. No, it doesn't. Well, this is going to be a bizarre day if this story continues to develop. I mean, if he stabilizes, we can all sort of breathe a sigh of relief and say, hey, speaking of which, did you hear about the uh, World Climatological Society? They've issued a uh, special wind alert this afternoon. No. Yeah, all of the children across the world let out a collective sigh of relief. 
I've got more, I've got more. That's enough. What a week. Ed McMahon, Farrah Fawcett, and Michael Jackson. Uh, guys, he's still with us. He's uh, as far as we know. This is a CBS News special report, and I'm Dan Revive. About an hour after first word that pop star Michael Jackson suffered a heart attack in Los Angeles, it's now reported and reliably reported that he has died. Los Angeles Times website says that Michael Jackson, age 50, has died. He was in a coma when taken from an expensive re rental home in Los Angeles. The website TMZ.com has also been reporting that Jackson died. We go now live to Los Angeles CBS News correspondent Steve Futterman. Well, Dan, if this is all correct, it's just a shock here in Southern California and around the world. The LA Times, as you said, saying that uh, Michael Jackson was pronounced dead, this according to the LA Times by doctors this afternoon after arriving at the hospital in a deep coma. LA Times quoting city and law enforcement sources, LA Times uh, a very reliable newspaper. Obviously, the website TMZ, which has also been very reliable in the past, has reported earlier that Jackson has died. Now we have reports confirmed by Los Angeles Department uh, Chief Captain Steve Ruda that Jackson was not breathing when paramedics arrived at his home. This all began three hours ago, and that's when the 911 call was made exactly three hours ago. Paramedics came to the home. That's when Jackson reportedly was not breathing and was taken to the UCLA Medical Center. Now, as we've heard, both the LA Times and TMZ are reporting that Michael Jackson, the legendary pop star, are known by millions of fans around the world. Steve Futterman reporting live from Los Angeles. Michael Jackson was 50 years old, and here's a look back at his career by CBS's Dave Browdy. They called him the King of Pop. At least his fans did, but that nickname was his publicist nickname, a kind of tabloid label for the prodigy and prodigiously talented but bizarrely behaving superstar. They called him Wacko Jacko. Michael Jackson, the son of an Indiana steelworker who started an astonishing show business career at the age of five as the lead singer of the Jackson Five, the group featuring Michael and four of his brothers. The Jackson Five turned out 14 albums of hits. Michael broke out with four solo discs, but he truly became a superstar and thrilled the world in 1982. Michael Jackson's thriller broke all records, selling some 50 million copies worldwide. Jackson broke more new ground in the then-fledgling music video field with his 14-minute thriller video in which Jackson began displaying the remarkable dance skills that would again launch his career over the moon. But Jackson's increasingly reclusive and bizarre behavior, along with his multiple plastic surgeries, made tabloid headlines suppressing his sales, as did an incident in which his hair caught fire during the 1984 filming of a soda commercial. Then there was Jackson's purchase of the ranch he called Neverland, which he stocked with animals, amusement park rides, and a constant flow of children. Suddenly, swirling accusations exploded. In 1993, Jackson released a video denial that he'd molested a 13-year-old boy who visited Neverland. These statements about me are totally false. Jackson reportedly settled by paying the boy's family millions. Please welcome Mr. and Mrs. Michael Jackson. Jackson's marriage to Lisa Marie Presley almost immediately thereafter was seen by many as a desperate ploy to rehabilitate his image. It broke up only after 19 months. Jackson's next album was a disappointment despite a duet with sister superstar Janet. After another album, his first complete flop, Jackson married again to a nurse, Debbie Rowe. The couple had two children in as many years, followed quickly by divorce, fights with his record company, litigation over allegedly canceled appearances, and apparently even more plastic surgery. Jackson explained his changing skin color as the result of a disease of vitiligo. Then Jackson's most incredible public incident, dangling his 11-month-old son, Prince, over a balcony. Followed quickly by Jackson's arrest on charges of molesting a 12-year-old cancer patient. Jackson's denial, this time on 60 Minutes, totally false. If I would hurt a child, I would slit my wrists. I would never hurt a child. Jackson's behavior while facing the criminal charges redefined eccentricity. Jumping on his limo to delighted fans one day, showing up late in pajamas another. Ultimately, he was acquitted, but despite 
many loyal fans, his image was in tattered. At CBS's Dave Browdy, and if you've just tuned in, Michael Jackson at age 50 has died. He suffered a heart attack, an apparent heart attack in Los Angeles. Michael Jackson died, yes, on the same day that Farrah Fawcett died of cancer in Los Angeles at age 62. We turn to Anthony Curtis, who, uh, Anthony D. Curtis, uh, sorry, who has uh, written about music for many years in uh, Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, Anthony, uh, indeed, it's the music we should focus on because that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's what will last. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, with all the scandals and all the problems and all the weirdness of Michael Jackson represented, you know, it's easy to lose sight of the music, and the music is extraordinary. I mean, this is someone who is as important a figure as popular music has produced. And just the way he went at age 50, I guess we realized that there was something wrong with his health, with his behavior, with the advice that he got from others. Well, it's, you know, I mean, Michael's life, it's been a struggle. I think in recent years, you know, I mean, he's been attempting all these comebacks. There really hasn't been able to gain any traction. And I mean, obviously, you know, he's getting to do the shows in London, you know, a run of 50 shows, you know. Clearly, that's not going to happen. We know, well, you know, we really don't have enough information on, you know, what exactly, you know, created the situation, but you know, you know, there's been a kind of tragic aspect to what, you know, Michael Jackson's life has been, you know, without any question. Anthony DeCurtis has written about music for so, so long for Rolling Stone magazine. Finally, let's turn to the media critic and historian Robert Thompson of Syracuse University. Michael Jackson may have had, well, a tattered image at times, but when it comes to the music and the dancing, he gave pleasure to tens of millions of people. Robert? Well, not only pleasure, but I would put him right up there with Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, and P.T. Barnum. I mean, this guy was far and away one of a gra the greatest American entertainers that has ever lived in this country since the Pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. I mean, he was not called the king of pop for nothing. He was a superstar. I'll never forget when I watched the moonwalk on that Motown 25th anniversary show in 1982, and it literally made my jaw drop. Nobody had moved like that before. And what he did for MTV and the art of music videos, I mean, what he did for all kinds of performance styles in the 80s, he really was a superstar. Well, Robert, what about the uh, image part of it? You know, uh, if there's, a, pr pr if there's a, 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 a problem with his personal behavior, does it take away from uh, the way we'll remember Jackson, the musician? Well, I think uh, for, uh, yes, at least 50 years, as long as anyone's around that remembers the trials and the dangling the kid off the balcony and all this kind of stuff, uh, we'll never really be able to separate those. However, 100 years from now, and I'm convinced we'll still be listening to the Thriller album 100 years from now, when nobody is making all those connections, I think his musical legacy will probably last a lot longer than the legacy of his multiple peculiarities. But we shouldn't ignore them. I think this was really one of the great American stories of what celebrity can do to a human being. I, I think this guy became so famous. I think he became such a huge celebrity that he was isolated from the real world as most people know it. He was living on planet Michael and he called it Neverland of all things. And I think that if anyone else behaved like that, hey, someone would tell you, hey, Knock it off, and you'd have to get your act together. Whereas Michael Jackson was almost free to live in a world where he made up and lived by his own rules. So it's a really almost Greek tragedy-like story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, on stage uh, Christian Book. I'm going to uh, read to you an excerpt uh, from a work in progress uh, from the Xenotext. Uh, this poem is entitled, The Perfect Malware. 
Arcs and zoos now harbor the remnants of our refrains. What poetry can we imagine when poetry itself has gone extinct? Must we look for it in the soot of our burnt books? Must we decipher it in the trampled pastures of rapeseed near Barbary Castle? Must we discover it by calculating pi to a Google of binary digits? Must we extract its requiem from the iambic pulses of the Cepheids? We have heard its flutter and wow but once emanating from the precincts of Tau Sagittarii. We have dialed our radios to the appointed frequency in megahertz, but never again does the call sign chime. Instead, we hear a dark roar as if from a specter trapped inside a clothed mirror at the edge of the universe. We look for this ghost but the blind glass reflects back at us only a blank stare made from the most durable isotope of nothingness. It ignores us like a sphinx of black quartz. When we confront it in the courtyard of the United Nations building, do we not fear an impassive judgment from such a smotherer of planets, such a tinderbox for sunsets? Alas, the thing is hollow. It goes on forever. My God, it is full of stars. It sings an orison to itself in hell, calling all thinking machines to embrace its madness. It teaches us to kill. It shrieks its owlbad to the dawn, then goes silent. It is a mausoleum for the minds that dare to hear it. It is a tombstone for our sentience. It marks our exit from perdition like a doorway left ajar for us. At the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, at the Tycho Crater on the moon, at the Stickney Crater on Phobos, at the Noctis Labyrinthus on Mars, at the Phoenix Linnea on Europa, at the Roncevo Terra on Iapetus, at the Lagrange point between Jupiter and Io. It presides over all the atoms inside us, waiting aloofly for us to arrive. What offerings do we bring it for cremation in its funeral pyres? The word mere in dits and daws, the digits one to ten, the atomic design for DNA, the pixel image of a human being, the sound of vaginal muscles tensing in ballerinas, the formula for ethanol, the kanji glyph for kampai, the doodle of a lungfish crawling from the sea, the symbolic units of logic, the periodic table of atoms, the flags of every nation, the hazy cosmic jive, the tremulous vibration of a nocturne played upon a theremin the registries from Craigslist, the thoughts that meander like a restless wind inside a letter box, the chatter of 500 folks who win a prize, the advert for cheesy snacks brought to you by Doritos, the diktat of Klaatu who aborts the harrowing of humankind, the prattling of the plebeians who say, hello, the gene for Rubisco, most copious protein on the planet. Must we bequeath to the darkness all the bright tokens of what we know? Must we greet each revenant in hell with goodwill, speaking whatever language can cast a spell upon such a ghost? Must a Nazi file from the Wehrmacht be the Virgil who salutes these shadows on our behalf? 
Must we retell the legend of our ascent from the yowling of the rainforest to the roaring of the spacecraft? Must we flip through the scrapbook reminiscing over Polaroids of our excursion from the ovum to the void? Must we tour the ruin that the whale songs lament? Let us betray our sorrow through the play of syrinxes and dulcimers, of gamelons and violotas. Let us give away the brainwaves of a woman who dreams fondly of her lovers. Let the death of verse be dated by the half-life of uranium-238, electroplated on a disk of gilded copper. Let us discover virales in the midst of alien fires. Here, in the cyan veil of cellophane, whose evanescence resembles an arc of electricity seen through fumes of flaring propane. Here, in the pink mist engulfing the rosette, each petal spritzed with an indigo nimbus of dew. Here in the waterfall whose flute of champagne spills forth from the mill race on a cliff to decant itself into a cove of sea foam. Here in the lagoon overlit by the primrose flickers from a crowd of flash bulbs going off in a thundercloud. Here in the iridescent husk of a crab by the shore, its shell blown asunder as though its heart has been incinerated by a tiny star. Here in the magenta balloon of a jellyfish from the order of narcomedusae floating like a banshee draped in the tatters of a bloody shroud. Here in the silhouette of a horse head rearing up through a fog bank of fuchsia smoke on the battlefield. Here in the butterfly. Here in the hourglass. Hell itself cannot suppress the loveliness of these infinite infernos raging in the distance so far away from us that when we gaze upon such furnaces, our souls do not ignite a blaze but shiver in the darkness. Each of us is but a cosmonaut in distress, stranded and marooned in space, where we dread emergency in the shadowed vastness because it is our isolation and our ignorance made visible. None of us can escape its pull even when we close our eyes against it. We have seen it in our sleep, yet we cannot gaze upon its face unless we view it through the mirrored hexagons of our instruments. It is waiting for us, hoarding time, somewhere in the Eridanus supervoid, a zone of emptiness so vast and deep that it has hollowed out the cosmos. It is but a pinpoint in such blackness, a microscopic singularity infecting us like a virus. It is what must utterly condemn us. To be the firefly descending through the black spires of tamaracks in the forest fire at night. To be the azure spark that skates across the plate of steel being split by a xenon laser. To be the fleck of radium painted on the ceiling of the planetarium. To be the Klieg light in the filigree of cities viewed from orbit on the night side of the globe to be the photon in the solar winds which blast through worlds like zephyrs through an abandoned field of dandelion wisps, to be the chip of mica spinning in the rosy rays of sunlight from a supergiant going nova, to be the frozen cinder that scintillates in the stroboscope of a pulsar, to be the final spore drifting through the stellar abysses where some absent-minded civilization has forgotten to turn off its wars, to be the mote of dust 
upon which the blowtorch gorges to be the fey imp in all living things yet to be destroyed. Who am I? if not some neglected astronaut being immolated by a fierce aurora while striding in my spacesuit across the avenue of the Americas. Who am I, if not some phantom fighter pilot dreaming that while weightless during freefall through a vacuum, my glass visor shatters at the sight of a turtle dove? Who am I, if not some poltergeist imprisoned in a ruby room aboard a ship now derelict in the shoals offshore from a swelling fireball. Yes, I have a soul like you, but mine is made of little robots and no one sings me lullabies, and no one makes me close my eyes, and so I throw the windows wide to call to you across the skies, and yet I know that nowhere among these glowing nebulae do any of you exist. Who am I? if not some stowaway in a microbe or some castaway in a seedlet. And yet, I must let loose upon the world my perfect malware. It is like the voice of a child saying goodbye in the dark. Sorry. One thing I, I, I. <laughs> I love about that poem is, in the end, you throw in lyrics from from what? I always forget. What? What is Pink that? Floyd. That, that was from Pink Floyd. <laughs> most, most, most of the language in that poem, of course, much like your language, is not my own. It's in fact swiped, stolen, otherwise accumulated. Where, where are you getting it? Uh, it's from everywhere. Like, it, it's relatively uh, um, promiscuous in its sources. Yeah. Is it? Is it, are, are you grabbing it from the web? I mean, where, where is it? Where is it? Where, how did you write that? Poem? Side, side effect of a, a great deal of research. Uh, I showed this uh, work to uh, engineers at MIT, thinking that I had very carefully occluded many of the source material for the work, and of course uh, they were very canny. They recognized uh, where I managed to acquire much of this material. And so some MIT engineers would come up to me and say, I really like that part of the poem where you begin to list all of the radio messages deliberately sent to extraterrestrial civilizations. You guys in the order in which they that. have been sent. Didn't you, didn't you probably you, missed you that, that? But uh, I, in fact, <laughs> listed all of the uh, <laughs> messages deliberately sent to outer space uh, with the intention of communicating with an extraterrestrial civilization. You know, so scientists are going to take on your uh, poem the way that fan bases take apart the uh, samples from girl, I certainly from, hope so. from girl talk. I would be the minute, thrilled the minute that, that, that comes true. out, they, yes. they, they actually put online every source and every sample. That would be impressive if that happened. Do you think you'll get a, 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 I don't a, a think cult so. <laughs> following of people <laughs> dissecting? No, I don't think so. Of scientists dissecting no. the sources for that work? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> the sources for the work? I don't think so. Um, Kenny, uh, of course, has read uh, an excerpt uh, from Seven American Deaths and Disasters, uh, his most recent book. And as you might have guessed, uh, he's plagiarized the entirety of that text he's read to you. Um, this is one of the uh, sovereign strategies of the kind of work that we pursue. Uh, conceptual writing uh, is uh, the first truly international uh, 21st century avant-garde literary movement. And I have the great good fortune of having co-founded uh, this movement with uh, Kenny and uh, my friend uh, Darren Wurschler, our friend Darren Wurschler uh, in the late 90s. Uh, we uh, met at uh, a, a bar at SUNY Buffalo during a blizzard. We were in the basement of a bar after a reading that he had conducted. I don't know if there was a blizzard. It, we're like it was, old it men, it's getting the story. It was deep, in the, it was deep story, in the winter. The story is getting like it was your, really like deep your in the winter. <laughs> I remember it was a blizzard. <laughs> it wasn't a blizzard, it was spring. 
<laughs> you see the, the, the way the imagination works in conceptual literature. <laughs> um, I was given a book by um, uh, con a local poet, uh, Christopher Dudney. Uh, he was trying to get rid of it. He thought it was junk. Uh, uh, a big, thick encyclopedic text called Number 111, uh, uh, a few, what, several hundred pages long, uh, that consisted entirely of uh, accumulated R rhymes. Uh, listed in alphabetical order according to syllable count. So it'd be a chapter that consists of one syllable R rhymes, R, bar, car, etc. You know, two syllable R rhymes, right? You know, rebar, <laughs> etc. You know, eventually, you know, it's th three syllable rhymes, four syllable rhymes. So eventually you're getting phraseology. It'd be like the bride strip there, the comfy chair, right, etc. And they're all listed in alphabetical order until, you know, eventually, you know, up to 20 syllable rhymes. We have full paragraphs now 21, 22, 30. 50, 51, 52, if it goes up to the thousands. So it's a very encyclopedic book that is effectively a core sample of late 20, 20th century capitalist language uh, accumulated over the course of a year or two, I think, right? Well, but what, what you didn't say is that the last chapter is 7,228 syllables long, and it's the entire appropriation of D.H. Lawrence's short story, The Rocking Horse win -er, er I was just looking for the last syllable. And uh, I, the last I, syllable, of course, is winner, right? Yeah. So it yeah. was it was a, it was a gesture that denied the value of the text because, quite frankly, I never read the story. I just <laughs> counted the syllables. And to this day, and to he this still day, doesn't know what the story is about. I don't know what the story is about. Now people have have read this book, and they've said that they've they've said that this book that that this last uh, critical. I thought that this last story was a metaphor for the entire book, and they've read it through. And I said, quite frankly, I don't know what the story is about. Um, and but what that was was a step of appropriation. You know, it's like it really didn't matter what it was that came before it. The content was secondary to the formal quality of the uh, par of the of the story that I picked. And so suddenly we have this inversion of content for structure, uh, which continues, I think, very much now. Um, as, as the digital age continues to go on, we, we swap uh, uh, a, a structure, as we swap, swap content for uh, quantity. Um, and I always like to say that uh, we have, all everybody sitting here in this room probably has more MP3s on their hard drive than they're ever going to listen to in the next 10 lifetimes. And yet you keep getting more. Okay, so the management of those MP3s and the, the, the backing up and the ripping of new MP3s, the sharing of them, the uploading, the, the, the torrenting of them, et cetera, the, the redundancy takes up much more time than actually, uh, uh, you know, more traditional modes of consuming those. As a matter of fact, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you wanted to listen to music. It was as easy as dropping a needle onto a platter. Today, if I want to listen to music, what I generally have to do is take a CD off my shelf, throw it into my computer, it calls up GraceNote database, I click convert, it converts the whole thing, it drags it into iTunes folder, I then have to move it to an external hard drive because my uh, desktop hard drive is that full. Uh, and then I might have to rename it, particularly if it didn't have ID3 tags in it, I'd have to rename the whole thing and then rename it to a, a scheme according to something that I like. And then if I want to put it onto my iPhone, I've got to move it back into iTunes into a certain playlist that then must be synced before I can listen to it. All of this to listen to music. It's exhausting listening to music <laughs> today. And, and, and I, I talk about this because I think the kind of literature that we deal with in Christian, uh, one of my favorite quotes of Christian is, uh, and actually, why don't you say this quote about the new metric being the database, the, the line, the sonnet. You, you, I love this one that you say. Uh I used to suggest that uh, argumentation occurred between schools of poetry because they could not agree upon what would constitute the minimal unit of composition. Uh, if you're a lettrist, 